Hello, wonderful students. Today, we will be learning about chemical equilibrium here on Chemistry. To start off, we need to review um, irreversible reactions. We've learned about reactions that go forward. So reactants that turn into products and stay as products. An example of this is combustion. We know that if we have a hydrocarbon, when we react it with oxygen, it burns and turns into carbon dioxide and water. Now there is no way of getting methane and oxygen back after that reaction. Once something is burnt, it is burnt. Therefore, we use an arrow that just goes one way. It's an irreversible reaction. However, there are such things as reversible reactions. Reversible reactions, as you can guess, go back and forth. So when I had nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas, they react to form ammonia. However, ammonia will also decompose to make hydrogen and nitrogen. Therefore, the reactants will make the products, but the products will also make the reactants. They can go back and forth. So we use a double arrow to show reversible reactions. So any reaction that can go back and forth is reversible. Now, there is something really special about reversible reactions, and that's what we call equilibrium. Equilibrium, it sounds a lot like it is. We all know that the universe likes to be equal in all things. So high concentration will go to low concentration. You're going to switch places until you're equal. Well, chemical reactions are the exact same way. They like to be equal. So at equilibrium, the rate of reactants changing into products is the same as the rate that the products change into the reactants. So in a reversible reaction, they're changing at the same weight. They are changing at the, the same amount over time. Um, so we denote this mathematically as rate forward equals rate reverse. So whatever I do forward, what's coming backwards is going to be the same. And then the concentrations of the reactants and products, they're not changing because they're actually um, making the same amount of reactants and products at the same rate. So the concentrations, how much I have of a reactant and how much I have of a product, is going to be the same. So here's the three big things about equilibrium. And we're going to talk about them a little more in depth, so don't worry if you're a little confused. Now on your notes, you see that dynamic equilibrium is the terminology that we use. Um, so dynamic and equilibrium. Dynamic, what does that mean? We already know equilibrium means the same rate going back and forth, but dynamic means something else. So dynamic actually means change. Something is changing at equilibrium. And equilibrium means something is staying the same. So how can something be changing and be the same all at the same time? Well, in a chemical reaction, the atoms are being reconnected. So what's changing is my reactants are reconnecting and turning into products, and then my products are reconnecting and turning into reactants. So my reactants and my products are constantly changing into one another at equilibrium. And then equilibrium, what's staying the same? Well, their rates are. So the, the how fast they're moving back and forth, that's what's staying the same. So when we talk about dynamic equilibrium, we're talking about what's changing and equilibrium is what's staying the same. So the atoms are changing, but the rate at which they change are staying the same. All right, so let's talk about a man digging a well. Okay. So let's think about Al. Al is outside and he's got this lovely shovel and nothing to do. Jim, however, is trying to dig a well so that he can get to the water beneath and actually get some water in his well so he can drink it. So Jim begins shoveling. Doo -doo -doo -doo. He shovels and he throws the dirt out. But then Al is like, hey, I'm bored and I want to mess with Jim. So I'm going to pick up the dirt that he just threw out, and I'm going to throw it back in. And so while Al is throwing dirt back in, Jim is trying to throw dirt back out. 
Now, if you look, they have the same size shovels, or theoretically they do. So Jim is scooping up one dirt full of shovel and or one shovel full of dirt and throwing it out, and Al is picking up one shovel and throwing it back in. All right. So what happens? Well, if Jim is throwing the same amount of dirt out, then that means that Al is going to be throwing the same amount of dirt back in, so nobody's going to make any progress. But let's say that Al, okay, or Al is up here, Al is a shorter distance from the well, correct? So let's say Jim is working really hard and he's throwing out that dirt. And Al's just, you know, biding his time, waiting, 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 waiting. And then he decides, okay, now it's time to mess with him again. So Jim has just thrown a bunch of dirt out of the well, okay? And he's throwing it at one shovel per second. So shovel, throw, shovel, throw. So Al comes along and he's like, okay, I'm going to do the same thing. Shovel, throw, shovel, throw, shovel, throw. Well, what just happened? Al has the same amount of dirt up here. Jim has the same amount of dirt down there because they're constantly switching at the same rate. So that's the equilibrium part. They are doing, they're both going at the same rate. They're sending dirt up at the same rate. They're throwing dirt down at the same rate. Then, um, so what's changing? Well, Jim's dirt is now becoming Al's dirt. And Al's dirt is now becoming Jim's dirt. And so what's changing, what's dynamic about this example is that your Al's dirt is turning into Jim's dirt and Jim's dirt is turning into Al's dirt and nobody's making any progress because they're both going at equal rates and they're both shoveling the exact same amount so there's nowhere to go they're going to stay at the same rate so the only way for Jim to complete his project is if Al gets really really tired and stops working this is sweat by the way so if he starts sweating and he's like whoo I'm done then Jim can finally finish as well. But as long as they're in dynamic equilibrium, nothing's going to change. So, stage three, here we go. Equilibrium. Eventually, they're going to reach the same amount. It's not going to work. So, um, we're going to change at the same rate. Now, um, if we continue this, if they continue and neither of them gets tired and they're just going to keep going and shoveling at the same rate, what's going to happen? Well, if both are shoveling at the same time, then nothing's going to happen. There's not going to be any more dirt in the well. There's not going to be any more dirt out because they're constantly going back and forth. So how is, does this show you dynamic equilibrium? Take a moment and answer number six. All right. So now that you're done with number six and we have a general idea of what dynamic equilibrium is, let's look at chemical equilibrium. All right. We're going to look at it in terms of chemicals. So go ahead and read this information, and then we're going to start with number seven. All right, so now that you have read this, measuring equilibrium. What is KEQ? Well, as you read, KEQ is the equilibrium constant, and it tells you how much product is being made and how much reactant is being made. All right, and mathematically, we represent this by KEQ is the concentration of products over reactants. Now a coefficient, remember in your balanced chemical equation, that's the big number in front. So you always have your concentration of your products raised to their coefficient. Um, just a few reminders. Concentration in molarity can be shown as brackets, so we don't use big M in here. Coefficients, balanced chemical equation, and solids and liquids do not have a concentration, right? You can't have a concentration of a solid. It's one thing. So the only thing that belong in our equilibrium expressions are aqueous and gases. All right, and you'll see what I mean as we continue. So which phases are included? Aqueous, gases. All right, so what does it mean if KEQ is relatively large? Well, let's take a look. If KEQ is relatively large, that means my numerator has to be big, correct? And if KEQ is relatively small, that means that my denominator has to be big. So if 
my numerator is big, if my products are large, or there are a lot of them, then my KEQ is going to be bigger, okay? So if KEQ is greater than one, products are going to be favored. That means I'm going to be making more products in equilibrium than I do um, reactants. But if KEQ is less than one, that means reactants are favored. And so that means I'm going to be, ha I'll have more reactants in my equilibrium than my products. All right. So let's look at some examples. Number 10. So number 10 is asking us to write the equilibrium expressions. So go ahead and see if you can uh, write the equilibrium expression for these three examples. Okay, now that you've tried that, let's look at the answer, shall we? So we have A to plus B, D to E. So products, D to the D, E to the E, over A to the A, B to the B, right? Products over reactants, that's what we said. But wait, B is a solid and D is a liquid, so they are not included. So the equilibrium expression for E, or for this equation, is E, the concentration of your products, to their coefficient, the concentration of your reactants, to their coefficient. Products over reactants. So go ahead and fix B and C if you think you made a mistake. All right, so here's B, products over reactants. All of them are gases, so all of them are included. There are no coefficients and no exponents. And for C, P4 is a solid and P406 is a solid, so they're not included. They do have coefficients, so I need to make sure to raise them to their correct power. And we have products over reactants. All right, so that's how you write an equilibrium expression. So we're really particular about units, right? We want to know the units. Well, just so you know, KEQ can be a naked number. It does not need pants. It depends on your equilibrium expression. So if we look back here, we have molarity times molarity divided by molarity times molarity. If you have molarity squared divided by molarity squared, they're both going to cancel out and that equals one. There are no units. However, if we look at this equilibrium expression, we have molarity cubed divided by molarity to the sixth. So this means that our units are molarity to the negative three. So sometimes it has units, sometimes it doesn't and it can be a naked number. Go ahead and try number 11 and see if you can come up with your KEQs. All right, so now that we know how to write our KEQs, we know how to write our expressions, we have to be able to solve them. So in number 12, we have carbon monoxide and water make hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So the first thing we need to do is we need to write the expression, just like we have done before. So products over reactants. Then we need to plug in our numbers. They give us concentrations for each of them. So here we go. KEQ is CO2 times H2 over CO times H2O. Okay, carbon monoxide times water. Then if they give me the concentrations, it's simple plug and chuck. CO2, the concentration for CO2 is, oh, it's right there. 0.42 goes right there. Then I fill in the rest, and I'm going to multiply, multiply, divide, and I will get, go ahead and put it in your calculator, see if you can get it. Ta-da! 1.3. Okay? So whenever you're doing these, it's just plug and chug. You're putting in concentrations. All right? Go ahead and try number 13. So for number 13, here's your answer. Equilibrium expression, plug in your numbers, and you get your answer. So that is 13. I want you to try number 14 and bring that to class, as well as 15 and 16. And then when you get to how do you know if a reaction has reached equilibrium, that is the part we will be doing in class. 
All right. Thanks for tuning in.